This is God's day. It's a good day, so let us rejoice. My name is Kim Gilliland. I'd like to welcome you here for our online worship at Cottom United Church. Just to remind you, we do have in-person worship on Sunday mornings at 9.30. We're now up to 25%, so there's a fair bit more room. If you want to come and join us in person, please do so. If you can't do that, if you're not comfortable yet, we will continue to offer our online worship for you. We are also in our uh, in-person worship offering some child care programs for school-aged children. So if that helps you at all, then please let us know and come out and take advantage of that too. With that in mind, I'd like to turn you over to Linda, who will lead us in our call to worship. Our call to worship today is found in Psalm 48, starting at verse 9. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, help us to have open hearts and open minds toward receiving your unfailing love and also to receive your discipline and correction, Heavenly Father, when that is necessary. We thank you for you being a constant presence in our lives, and we ask you now to help us to be receptive to the word that you are about to bring. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi. Well, this week in the tour of the Bible, we're landing in Joshua. And you might remember from previous stories that Moses rescued the people from Egypt and they've been wandering around the desert for 40 years. Moses isn't going to get into the promised land, but Joshua is going to be able to take his people in. They just have one tiny little obstacle, and that is that there are people already occupying the land that they need to go through. And so Joshua decides to send a couple of spies on ahead to see kind of the lay of the land and how big the enemy was and how many there were. And they came upon the house of a woman named Rahab. Now, Rahab was not a woman of high standing, we'll say, in the community. And so the spies went to her and she hid them. And basically, she saved their lives so that they could go back to Joshua and report the information that they had gained from, you know, kind of going and seeing what was happening. And when Rahab was hiding the spies, of course, the news got out that there might be people lingering about in the city and folks came to the door, asked her if she'd seen any of them. And she kind of denied that, that she was hiding anyone because technically they were up on the roof. And in exchange for protecting the spies, she asked that when the Israelites came through that her and her family would be spared. Now, some of the Bible stories that we study are a little bit tricky to try and understand how to apply them to our lives. And we have to kind of set out beyond the actual stories and look for the major themes or what's the most important thing in this story. And I think one of the themes is that God does rescue us and does protect us when we're in very difficult circumstances. So we've got these two spies, right? And they kind of need to be protected and rescued. And Rahab said, yes, I will do that for you. And then, you know, she needs protecting for herself and her family. And because she helped the spies, then her family was protected. And so sometimes we find ourselves in very difficult situations and we need to reach out and ask for help from other people around us. And sometimes they're the most unlikely people who are going to give us a hand and protect us. But when we're in trouble and when we ask God for help, he will provide someone to protect us, to rescue us, to come alongside of us and take care of us. And that's probably one of the things that I want you to remember about this story about Rahab and the spies that Joshua sent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you will protect us and that you will send people to stand with us and walk beside us when we're going through difficult times. And we thank you for that, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, friends. Well, here we are, step two in the reopening of the problems of material. And I think it's a signal that we're moving ahead. We're getting ahead of this COVID thing and maybe on the road to getting back to normal in one sense or another. You know, it's good to be back in in-person worship at 25% even. It's good to see people. 
I'm looking forward to doing other things like singing maybe as a congregation in the fall. Who knows? Won't that be wonderful the first time? And I'm looking forward to our first pot blessing lunch whenever that's going to be because we really miss those in the church. We love to sing and we love to eat. We're looking forward to getting back to some sort, sort of normalcy. But even then, we also realize that we're not going to go back to the way things were. There will be differences when we get back that have been caused by COVID, and that's just going to be the way it is for everybody. But in the midst of those changes, in the midst of those um, alterations that we are going to face in our, in our ministry, God still has a mission for us. God still has a purpose. And when God gives us a mission and God gives us a purpose, we need to trust God to provide for those things. And that's kind of what today's story is all about. Stepping out in faith, trusting God to provide what we need. The reading is from Mark chapter 6, verse 6 to 13. I want to share it with you now. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for your journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but no extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Jesus sends out the 12 apostles to do ministry. Interesting. Within this passage, there are four distinct things that Jesus points to in terms of the way we need to trust God when we're stepping out of ministry. We're going to look at each of those one by one. The first one is this. We need to trust God that we are not alone. We see that in verse 7 where it says, Jesus called the twelve to him, He began, and he sent them out, not one by one, but two by two. He sent them out in pairs. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all. He said to them, you know, it's time to go. You've watched me do my ministry. You've, you've been listening to me preach the good news. You know what it is. And now it's your turn. Good idea because Jesus knew that he wasn't going to be around forever and that the good news still had to be shared. So might as well give them some practice while he's still around. He sends them out, but not alone. Because that could be nerve-wracking. All by yourself. No one to listen to, no one to bounce things off of, no one to ask questions of, no one to help you when you've forgotten something. And so he sends them out two by two. Because when one forgets, the other remembers. When one is afraid, the other can give them comfort. When one is discouraged, the other can build them up. There are so many advantages to going out there in pairs, not by ourselves. And the same thing is true for us, you know that? There is no model in the Bible for us to do ministry one by one. Jesus always sends people out in groups, in pairs or twos or threes or fours. That's what Jesus always does things. I've often found that's true during COVID. I don't know what I'd do if I was by myself in ministry. It's been common for me to talk to various people in the church or even outside the church and say, what do you think about this? I don't know what to do with this. Do you have any ideas? And so I would bounce things off people and get some feedback, and that would be really, really helpful. Sometimes I'd be discouraged, and they would encourage me. Sometimes I'd be frightened, and they would calm my soul. Sometimes I wouldn't know what to do, and they'd have some ideas. So knowing that I was not, not alone in COVID has been a very helpful thing, and not only during COVID, but the rest of my ministry as well. The nice thing about knowing that you're not alone is that even when there's no one else there, and sometimes you're not, there's not, God is there. And so you are never alone. The Holy Spirit is just as close as a heartbeat. God is with you always. That's the first thing. We need to trust God that we are not alone. The second thing is this. We need, we need to trust God to give us a purpose. And he does that. Listen to what the purpose of the disciples was in verse 12. 
It says, they went out and preached that people should repent. They went to preach and call people to repentance. That was their mission. That's what they did. Preach the good news. Call people to repentance. You see, Jesus did not send them out purposeless. He didn't say, well, go on out there and do something. No. Jesus sent them out there with a reason, for a reason. And he sends us out there for the same thing. Jesus gives us a reason to minister. He gives us a mission. He gives us a purpose. We may not always know what that purpose is. Sometimes it's not always clear. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean we don't have a purpose. We do. Sometimes it just takes a while to, to understand what that is. I get that. Samuel was called as a young boy. He knew his purpose as a boy, what he was called to do by God. But not everybody is that fortunate. Abraham was 75 years old. It gets worse. Moses talked to that burning bush when he was 80. And what about Noah? When he got called to build the ark, which was his purpose, 500 years old. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a while, but that purpose does come. We need, need to trust God to give us a purpose. We trust God that we are not alone. We trust God for a purpose. The third thing we do, we trust God to give us the gifts and talents that we need to fulfill that purpose. We see that in verse 7, where Jesus uh, calls the twelve, and he sends them out two by two, but he gives them authority over impure spirits. Jesus knew that his disciples would face opposition. And that opposition would come in the form sometimes of impure spirits, unclean spirits. And so Jesus equips them to deal with those spirits even before he sends them out. That's a good thing. We need to understand that Jesus equips us, God equips us for what God calls us to do. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, where we read this. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. It says that Jesus equips us to do his will. And I believe he does that. He gives us abilities. We are born with abilities to do things. They're in our DNA. We have natural gifts and talents. There's other things that we have that we need to develop, our knowledge, our wisdom, our abilities. We need to hone sometimes the abilities that God gives us. But those two are God-given, and they are part of what we need to fulfill the mission which God calls us to do. I've often said before, and I'll say it again, that God has never called anyone to a mission or a purpose that God has not first equipped that person to do. The same holds true now as ever. So, we, need, we can trust God we are not alone. We can trust God we have a purpose. We can trust God that he gives us gifts and talents and abilities. The fourth thing is that we can trust God to give us the stuff that we need. We need stuff to do ministry, and God pr 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 provides that stuff. Verses 8 and 9, Jesus said this to his disciples. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Rather, wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. <laughs> he sends them out very minimally, doesn't he? A staff. Sandals. One shirt. One. No bread, no bag, no money. He sends them out minimally. Literally with the clothes on their backs. Why? So they can learn to trust him. It's easy to trust God when we have everything we need. That does not take a big leap of faith or trust. But if you don't know where your next meal is coming, coming from, if you don't know where you're going to sleep that night, if you don't know if you're going to have that shirt on your back tomorrow, all of a sudden, trusting becomes way more important. We need to trust in God for everything. You know, last week we talked about how we do that a little bit. We talked about money and giving generously. And 
how God provides for us with material things and, and, and money helps to buy those things. And not only does it help with the ministry of the congregation, it also helps us to support the missions that we find important, like Merchata House and like Downtown Mission and like the Essex Food Bank, amongst others. But God also provides for us beyond money. You know, we had the prayer garden. We built that last year. We maintain it now. We don't have anything around here to do that with, except people. And the people come, and they bring their shovels, and their rakes, and their hand trowels, and their wheelbarrows, and everything else that we need to keep that garden beautiful. God provides for us the physical things that we need. Jesus said, take a staff, take your sandals, take a shirt, but don't take any bread, don't take any money, don't take a bag. Leave that to me. I think in doing that, Jesus tried to do two things. The first thing we've already covered, he, he was trying to teach the disciples to trust him, to provide for what they need, to trust him, to trust God. But the second thing is this. I think he was trying to teach them that they don't need to carry unnecessary burdens. There are certain things in life that we lug around, even though they don't do us any good, and even though we don't need them or use them, we lug them around because, well, we're used to them and, and, we, and we know what to do with them, but they've outlived their usefulness. As Christians, we need to know the difference between what we need and what's a burden. A burden is something that we lug around that we just don't need anymore, okay? My question to you, how many of us lug around stuff like that? <laughs> how many of us carry burdens that we no longer need, that have no advantage for us? Not just as individuals, but also as churches. We do the same thing. My hunch is that all of us have those burdens that we carry around, don't we? We were thinking about this, uh, I was thinking about this this week as we were having our staff meeting with John Katz and Linda Lord and myself, and we had that on Wednesday. Always a good time to be together with those two people in Christ. John Katz is the one who's going online and finding out what people are saying about what the church is going to look like post-COVID. And uh, different people say different things, but all of them say one thing in common, and that's that the church post-COVID is going to look different than the church pre-COVID, and we better get used to that and understand that. I think that's true. 18 months ago, we were a very different church. Most of us had never been on a Google Meet meeting or a Zoom meeting. And now most of us know exactly what those things are, right? 18 months ago, we were thinking about maybe putting our worship online and live streaming it. Maybe. In a couple years. Well, Two months after COVID, we're, we have all the stuff we need, and we are live streaming, and we're recording, and doing all those things online, which we, which we would plan to do maybe two or three years down the line. And those are just the two obvious things in terms of, in terms of the changes that have happened. The most obvious things. The church is not going to be the same post-COVID, because the world's moved on with what it does, and so, so need we. It doesn't mean we change the uh, gospel or the, or the mission, but how we do it is going to change. And we have made some significant changes. And some of those changes are going to stay with us. Online meetings, my friends, are here to stay. I know some of our committees are talking about getting back to in-person worship, or in-person uh, meetings, rather, face-to-face. -face. But other committees just simply find that the online stuff is, is better, and they'll continue to do that. And even those committees that tend to meet face-to-face, -face, those groups that meet face-to-face, -face, are going to find times when, you know, that quick online meeting is just really handy. You know? And what about worship? Worship is going to be online from now on. And what difference does that make? Are there burdens around that, that we need to look at? Because some things work well in in-person worship that don't work so well when you're broadcasting to the world. One thing we don't want is dead air. That's a, that's a no-no when you're broadcasting. So we need to think about how we do things to avoid dead air. We also need to think about this. 
everybody in position of leadership in the front of the church is going to have to be comfortable with being on camera. What's that going to look like? And not everybody is. But how do we equip people to be comfortable doing that? The bottom line is this. There are some things that we did before, pre-COVID, that we need to reassess and rethink because they don't work post-COVID. Keep the stuff that works. Get rid of the burdens that, don't, that no longer do. Carry only what's essential. As Jesus sent out the disciples in a minimal way, let's hang on to the things that we do need and get rid of the stuff we don't. God provides, but I've learned this too, that God does not always provide according to our schedules. Sometimes things are provided early and on time, and sometimes things appear at the very last minute, and that's when we really do need to trust God. God sent over the disciples with nothing extra, just the basics. And what happened? How did their mission end up? Well, let's read verses 12 and 13 and find out. They went out, it says, and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. I think we would say that's mission accomplished. They did what they were called to do. And I'm sure Jesus was so happy with them when they came back and reported all that they had done. They took what they needed. They took no more. And they trusted God to provide. So should we. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as a universal church, believing in the teachings that you have given us, uniting us, in common narrative, common belief, in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the organization of church, that it meets the needs of so many people, and we recognize it is not a perfect institution, and that it has reflection and reconciliation as part of its history, part of its present, and part of its ongoing future. We thank you for the communities in which we live, Thank you for the opportunity to give to one another, to share the burden of those who don't have enough to eat, don't have full-time employment, don't have safe and secure relationships that they can depend upon. Help us to be the voice, the hands, and the feet of your message. We thank you, Heavenly Father, and pray for those who are our elected officials, those who keep us safe in our hospitals, our dental chairs, and our clinics. Thank you for those who have taught in this last year, whether it's elementary or secondary, university, college, or preschool. For those who care for even the youngest members of our communities and our families, Heavenly Father, we thank them for their dedication. And we just ask for a hedge of protection around them as they continue to do their work. We pray for our family and friends, Heavenly Father, whose pain and suffering and struggle may go unknown to us, but you know. You know the hearts and the minds of all of your children. And we thank you that you are omnipresent and all-knowing. And finally, Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves that we may know and recognize those opportunities that you give us to seize those moments where we can make a difference in someone's life. We ask you to forgive us for those times that we have fallen short. And we thank you that you are a God of second chances, 22nd chances, and 222nd chances, and opportunities to serve you. We thank you for all of these things, for all of the things that you have done for us in the past, and for all of the things which you continue to work to our good in this present moment, and for all those things that we do not yet see. In Jesus' name we pray through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us for worship. We pray that our time together has enabled you to live your week before Christ to make a difference in the world in your corner of creation. Until we see you again, take care and God bless. Amen.